generation of Americans has grown up taking the Federal Reserve System as much for granted as the United States Post Office. But there are many others who can still recall the time quite vividly when there was no Federal Reserve System, a time like the money panic of 1907. Ralph? John. Howdy. How's business, John? Well, <laughs> you don't have to ask me. You know. It's bad, Ralph. Just plain bad. This here money panic's really getting to be something. My customers can't pay their bills, but I gotta let them have groceries. They gotta eat. But that wasn't what you wanted to see me about. No, John, it wasn't. I'm afraid I have bad news for you. I'll give it to you straight. I'm having to call my loans. You mean when my note comes due next I week? I won't be able to renew it, John. I've got to ask you to pay it off. But, Ralph, wait a minute. When you let me have that money, you told me that you'd renew the note when the time came. I can't lay my hands on any $2,000. You know that. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry to have to ask you this, but I've got to have it. All of it. But, Ralph, what's going on here? I've sold groceries in this town and done business with you for a long time. I was good enough for that loan three months ago. How come I'm not good enough for it today? You can't talk this way to me, Ralph. I'm not going to take it from you. Look, will you let me explain this to you? This has nothing to do with you as a person or me as a person. It's this money panic we're in, John. It's got me just as much as it's got you. How? Well, John, it's like this. A bank like mine or anybody else's is in the business of lending people money at interest. Well, why don't you keep on doing it? That's just what I'm trying to explain to you. Now, here's how a bank like mine operates. You have a bank account here. We call it your deposit account. People like you deposit your dollars with us. You own those dollars. And we hold ourselves liable to pay them back to you at any time. So from our point of view, your deposits are our liabilities. And that's what we call them, deposit liabilities. But until you want your dollars back, we can use them. That is, most of them. The law requires us to keep some of them as legal reserves. Roughly, one reserve dollar for every four or five deposit dollars. The rest, we can lend or invest. What's that got to do with calling my loan? That's what I'm leading up to, John. Now, let's see what happened when I made you that loan of $2,000. You signed a promissory note for $2,000, and I credited your deposit account with $2,000. You didn't come and deposit $2,000 in cash. But you did give me your note for $2,000, and in exchange for your note, I created $2,000 of new deposit liabilities in your favor. This $2,000 is just as much of a liability to me as $2,000 you deposit in cash. I've got to back up both kinds of deposit liability with my reserve dollars. That note of yours and others like it we call commercial paper. This paper and other kinds of paper, like bonds we buy and government securities we buy, make up our portfolio of assets. If I get the drift of what you're saying, Ralph, you've got to have enough of what you call reserve dollars before you can make me a loan. That's it exactly, John. And this is where my correspondent bank comes in. Correspondent bank? Yes, a bank like mine usually deposits its legal reserves and other unused reserve dollars in a large city bank called its correspondent bank. This bank operates the same way we do. It has deposit liabilities, reserves, and a portfolio, same as we have, only on a larger scale. Now, in ordinary times, when you need bank credit, and I don't have enough reserve dollars to back up a loan I want to make to you, I just get some extra reserve dollars from my correspondent bank. But how do you do that? I either borrow them on my own promissory note or I rediscount some paper. Rediscount? Yes. Remember when you brought me Frank Lewis's promissory note for $100? I cashed it for you, didn't I? I discounted it for you. Yes, and that was a mighty big convenience for me, too, to get $95 in ready cash on Frank's note right when I needed it. And that $5 interest I charged you is what I call the discount rate. Well, just as I can discount a note for you, my correspondent bank can re-discount that note for me when I need extra reserve dollars. In other words, John, I can take some paper from my portfolio and offer it to my correspondent bank for re-discounting. When they re-discount it, they take it into their portfolio, just like I take your note into my portfolio. 
and they credit my reserve dollar balance, just like I credit your deposit account. And just like you can draw on your deposits in cash, I can then draw on my reserve deposits in cash. This cash is the kind of money you have in your pocket right now. Oh, you mean like uh, this national bank note? That's right. My correspondent bank is allowed to issue as many of these notes as it can back up with certain specified government securities. But Ralph, if they can print bank notes, how come they're short of money? You said they were short, didn't you? It's because they've issued all the notes they can against the securities they hold. They have no other way of issuing any more money. They're short. That's why they're calling their notes, too, just like me. Everybody's scared, Ralph. That's what it is. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. Everybody that loaned money to anybody else just wants that money back right now. I've got to pay you. You've got to pay your corresponding Citibank. And my depositors, John. People are drawing money out of my bank by the cartload. It's just like I said, Ralph. Everybody's plumb scared. Everybody's got to pay his debts to everybody else. And then what? Do I have to go bankrupt? Does Bob Peters over at the drugstore have to go bankrupt? Have you got to go out of business? I'm asking you, Ralph, why do we have to be in a mess like this? Do you mean to sit there and tell me that in this man's country, there's nothing we can do about a mess like this we're in? Sure, John, sure. There's something we can do about it. Somebody's have done it for many years now. Done what? Got themselves some sort of a central or reserve banking system where a bank like mine can always get reserve dollars when they need them. Well, for God's sake, man, why don't we do just that? It's up to Congress, John. It's been up to Congress for close on a hundred years. Congress could delay no longer. For five years, it worked intensively on the problem. And by the time Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey was elected to be the next president of the United States, a preliminary draft of reserve banking legislation was ready. But this conference is important, Dr. Katakum. Carter Glass is journeying up all the way from Washington for it. I know, Governor Wilson. But I don't want the next president of the United States on my hands with pneumonia. You've just come through a very strenuous campaign. And besides, Christmas of 1912 is going to go down in history as the coldest we've ever had here in Princeton. I'm sorry, Doctor, but Carter Glass and his subcommittee have been working eight months on this reserve bank legislation. And I regard this matter of such capital importance that this conference cannot be put off another day. All right, Governor Wilson. But promise me you'll get as much rest as you can. And you let them do the talking. <laughs> Come in, gentlemen. Come in. Oh, you must be called. Old Governor, yes, I suppose it is. But Dr. Willis and I have been so engrossed in discussing our banking bill that... Oh, may I present Dr. Willis? He's economic advisor to our subcommittee. And incidentally, my good friend. Dr. Willis, it was good of you to come with Mr. Glass in this weather. It's good of you to see us, Governor Wilson. We really should have postponed this meeting. Not at all, gentlemen, not at all. This legislation is long overdue. And I'm not going to let a little fever stand in the way. A memorandum, Governor. It contains the major provisions of our proposed banking and currency bill. Fine. Ah, something hot won't do you any harm, gentlemen. Help yourselves while I look this over. A bank called the Federal Reserve Bank. That will be, in a very real sense, a banker's bank. A bank where ordinary banks can rediscount paper. A bank which will issue currency. Yes, Glass, your bill really seems to go to the heart of the problem. It will now be possible for banks to increase their reserves at all times and we will not have to fear the kind of panic we had in 1907. Exactly, Governor. Banks that become members of the Federal Reserve System will always be able to get high-grade paper rediscounted at a Federal Reserve Bank. They'll deposit reserves with a Federal Reserve Bank just as they now do with their correspondent banks. And then, when a member bank takes paper to a Federal Reserve Bank for rediscounting, it will get its reserve account credited with the appropriate amount payable in our proposed Federal Reserve notes. And this new currency will always be available because it'll be based on the very paper which is rediscounted with the Federal Reserve Bank. 
We propose to back this new currency dollar for dollar by rediscounted paper in the Reserve Bank's portfolio and, in addition, by the Reserve System's gold reserve. Ah, the more currency needed, the more paper will be offered Reserve Banks for rediscounting. And the more paper is rediscounted, the more Federal Reserve notes can be issued. A very ingenious way of furnishing the currency with elasticity, gentlemen. In contrast to the present national banknote currency, based as it is on a fixed amount of government securities. I must say, Governor, I am gratified that you believe that a sound currency can be based upon rediscounted paper. I certainly think so, Glass. But what about the rediscounting rate, gentlemen? The rediscounting rate of a reserve bank can have fundamental and far-reaching effects on a country's economic conditions. Lower the rediscounting rate and you encourage bank credit. Raise the rate and you discourage bank credit. Who is going to decide what the new Federal Reserve Bank's rediscounting rate is going to be? The rates will be decided by each of the several regional reserve banks which this bill contemplates, Governor. I thought you'd say that, Glass. Your bill differs from all previous efforts in this country to establish reserve banking services in that you propose not a single central bank, but a number of regionalized reserve banks, each serving the need of its own reserve district. And you've made careful provisions for the local administration of each reserve bank by having the majority of directors chosen by member banks and the rest by the coordinating commission, which you propose to set up in Washington. However, Glass, I have one important addition to suggest. I suggest that this coordinating commission or board in Washington be strengthened and given ultimate responsibility for establishing and maintaining a national reserve policy, including the rediscounting rate. I think it only fair to say to you that I am for a plenty of centralization, but not too much. Just enough to ensure that national problems will be handled in the national interest, whether the sectional interests of some locality or other jump with the national interest or not. Meanwhile, I think, Glass, that you've come very far on the right track, and I'm looking forward keenly to working with you on this bill. 362 days after the famous Princeton Conference, the Federal Reserve Act became law. It is a matter of real gratification to me that in the case of this fundamental piece of legislation, there should have been so many votes cast for it on both sides of the House and Senate. It cannot, therefore, be called a partisan measure. The preamble of the act read, to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve Banks, to furnish an elastic currency, to afford means of rediscounting commercial paper, to establish a more effective supervision of banking in the United States. But within a very few years, the Federal Reserve's main task was generally recognized to be even greater. And today its main task is to promote stability in the country's economy by using its influence to bring about increases or decreases in the country's banking reserves. When money threatens to get too scarce, Federal Reserve authorities act to make more reserve dollars available. When money threatens to get too plentiful, they act to make less reserve dollars available. There are three forms of action they can take. For one thing, as Woodrow Wilson pointed out in the Princeton Conference, lower the rediscounting rate and you encourage bank credit. Raise the rate and you discourage bank credit. Second, reserves may be increased or decreased by the open market operations of Federal Reserve Banks. When a Federal Reserve Bank goes into the open market to buy government securities for, say, one million dollars from a securities dealer, the dealer deposits the Federal Reserve check in his bank. The bank sends the check to the Reserve Bank for collection, and the Reserve Bank in turn credits that bank's reserve balance with one million dollars. In other words, by buying one million dollars worth of securities in the open market, the Federal Reserve Bank adds one million dollars to the reserves of member banks, just as if it had rediscounted one million dollars worth of paper from their portfolios. And on the other hand, by selling one million dollars worth of securities in the open market, the Federal Reserve Bank decreases member bank reserves by one million dollars. In recent years, open market operations have far overshadowed other methods of bringing about increases or decreases in banking reserves. Finally, under more recent changes in the law, 
Member banks can be required within prescribed limits to increase or decrease the ratio of their legal reserves to their deposit liabilities, thus changing the amount of reserves available for backing up bank credit. By 1929, the Federal Reserve Banks had succeeded remarkably well in curtailing money shortages like the one of 1907. One example was the effect of Federal Reserve operations on money rates. Business drops off in volume after Christmas, rises around Easter, drops off again during the summer, then rises again at harvest time and at Christmas. In the days before the Federal Reserve System, the interest rates people paid for many bank loans follow this seasonal swing closely. And even in normal times, there used to be a very great difference between the low and the high interest rates for any year. Through the Federal Reserve System stabilizing influence, the seasonal swing in money rates had flattened out by 1929 to an almost straight line. But in that same year of 1929, the country was plunged into the most devastating depression of its entire economic history. In the light of the grave new problems brought on by the depression, the Federal Reserve Act was amended a number of times. The last of these great amending acts was passed in 1935. In April of that year, hearings on the legislation began before a Senate subcommittee. Chairman of this subcommittee was Senator Carter Glass, who at the age of 77 was better newspaper copy than ever. A great many problems. To some, I know the answers. To others, I don't. So, pull no punches, and I won't either. Would you say, Senator, that after this new bill is passed, the Federal Reserve System would be able to prevent another depression? That's a fair question, but I don't think that I or any other man can answer it. You see, back in 1913, when we framed the original act, we just did not foresee the sort of thing that hit us in 1929. We had in mind the old-time money panics, like the one in 1907. But the original act has been changed, Senator, several times. And we've been told the new legislation embodies the lessons of the Depression. So it does. In the act of 1933, for example, we set up federal insurance for bank deposits. And in the Securities Exchange Act, we put a stop to a number of abuses, like stock market speculation with bank credit. And in addition, the Federal Reserve now has authority to establish margin requirements for stock purchases. So, Senator, may I ask again, do you think we'll be able to prevent another depression? I'll answer your question this way. I'm not so simple as to believe that you can legislate human frailty out of existence. But I do think that we have lessened the chances that another depression of the same type will be visited upon us again. More than that, I can't say. Don't you think, Senator, that the new bill is going a little far on the centralization side with this new open market committee? You gentlemen know that I have stood all along for a decentralized system, one with regional responsibility, one in which bankers and businessmen cooperate, the sort of system President Wilson called a democracy of credit. But I have come to think that something else that President Wilson once said applies with even greater force to open market operations. I am for a plenty of centralization, he said, but not too much. Now, experience has shown us that open market operations should be coordinated for the system as a whole. As you know, these operations have grown to be more important than all other methods of credit control, like the rediscount rate, for example. But who decides, Senator? whether the country's credit conditions call for buying or selling on the open market. Is any one man that wise? No, and that's just it. No one man, nor any one reserve bank is that wise. That's why this bill sets up an open market committee on which both the individual reserve banks and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors will be represented. Will the Secretary of the Treasury continue to be uh, a member of the board? No, sir, he will not. Why not, Senator? Because the Treasury's job is to procure money for the government. 
And naturally, they want to borrow it as cheaply as possible. The Treasury is not primarily responsible for general credit conditions. The Federal Reserve System has the responsibility for credit policy. And that's why it should not be subordinated to any other government agency in doing its job. Of this, I am convinced, whatever the future may hold for our country. Neither Carter Glass nor any man could have foreseen in 1935 how the Federal Reserve System could be used in a time of grave national peril to smooth out the mountainous problems of financing a global war. Nor could he have foreseen the exact nature of the new monetary problems which the war would leave as one of its legacies. But the principle he announced back in 1935 is as sound today as it was then. As I look back over 25 years of banking legislation, I know this one thing. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was not intended to be, and it never could have been, a final or a complete document. New times bring new problems, and we must always modify the Federal Reserve System to meet them. Even after this bill becomes law, it will still be true that the Federal Reserve System is a piece of unfinished business. Carter Glass was right. It was true in 1935, as it is today that among the reasons for the far-reaching and fundamental contributions of the Federal Reserve System to our economic progress is the flexibility of the system, its ability to adjust to the challenge of that constant change which is inherent in our growing economy.